So I'd like to welcome each and every one of you this evening. And on behalf of uh, myself and on behalf of the old Bristol Historical Society, I'd like to not only welcome you, but thank you all very, very much for coming to this second talk in our series of five talks on the history of Bristol and the history of Maine in general. So we're very grateful to have Jim Clement here with us tonight to talk about Maine's first ship. But before we do, I have a little commercial to give to you, as usual, about Old Bristol Historical. And that little commercial is just simply four requests. And those requests simply are, firstly, that if there's anyone here among us who would like to volunteer for the Old Bristol Historical Society, whether helping out at the mill or the Bristol History Center or on the grounds, we would love to have you as a volunteer. Secondly, if you have any history about Bristol or your families, if you're from Bristol, we would love to receive that, either as a gift or if you could give it to us so that we could digitize that material for our historical records. So if you have photographs or any journals or diaries or historical material, we would be so grateful to have that to make it part of the vault and our history center. Thirdly, we are always looking for money, as most people are. <laughs> but indeed, we spend about $150,000 a year at the Bristol History Center. Doing what? Repairing the mill, making the Bristol History Center our very special kind of archive and place to be able to search your genealogy or search the history out. But we're always working to repair, to do it, and to get it all completed. We think we can probably do it in two to three years, but we do need the funds to get the underpinning of the mill constructed, to get the wheelchair ramp for the ADA bathroom completed, all these different projects. So if you would like to write out a check for $150,000, <laughs> we would always be very grateful for that. So don't hesitate, just speak with me afterwards. And the last thing, quite simply, is that um, we have a very special event coming up on August 21st. Very serious event. It's called the Rubber Ducky Race. So if anyone would like to buy rubber duckies, you can see different individuals. Uh, Linda, where are we? Well, well I, if you see people selling them, buy those tickets. We're trying to raise funds for that, and you can buy them for $5 a ticket, or for $25 you can get not a six-pack, but a six-quack. <laughs> <laughs> so, in any event, the race will be on August 21st. Down the kind of good day. So, thank you for that little commercial. Now on to the real deal. Jim, thank you very, very much for coming. Jim Parmentier comes to us from Brunswick. He originally hails from New Jersey. Jim attended Princeton University and then went on to the University of California at Santa Barbara where he did his PhD. He was an associate professor at Rutgers University where he taught clinical research practices and drug development. He was also an associate professor at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and a project manager for AstraZeneca, the British and Swedish pharmaceutical and biotechnological company headquartered in Cambridge, England. Jim has spent considerable time on the water, sailing, rowing, as well as constructing small wooden boats. We share a lot in common. And uh, he came to and retired in Brunswick in 2012 and is currently building a 19-foot lobster boat in his home workshop. Jim also has volunteered as part of the Virginia Maine's first ship construction crew ever since he and his wife Beth moved to Brunswick. Jim was also invited to join Maine's first ship board of directors and serves as their on their education committee. As he puts it, we have to learn how to handle and sail a 17th century ship and to teach others about America's early nautical history while at the same time monetizing Virginia's activities so she'll be self-sustaining and well-maintained in the years ahead. So, would you join with me now in giving Jim a warm welcome. <laughs>
Thank you, Bob, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be speaking to you this evening in a setting and in a community that's familiar to me. I recognize several friends in the audience. I've crawled around the Pemaquid Ledge as part of a geology class at Bowdoin when I first came up here. I've sailed through the thread of life with the courage of a saint, spent several nights at anchor in Poorhouse Cove and behind Witch Island, so I know your area. Um, and I also know that I've been working here and then I know your interest in the Maine's first ship project to reconstruct Virginia, as Bob said, it's the first ocean-going vessel that was built by Europeans in the New World. This working reconstruction that you'll see, and we now have, is a springboard for us to tell many aspects of Maine's centuries-old connection to the sea. I'd like to begin by finding the appropriate button for going forward. I think it's this one. No. That's Fred's song. We're going to have to stop that one. <laughs> I can do this. I can do this. All right, here we go from the beginning. All right. And then we go to there. It's supposed to pop up to that, and it's supposed to go... Oh, great. <laughs> this is one of those issues of, of practice. Now let's try and do it this way. We're not going to do it from the current slide. From the beginning, we're going to do it from the current slide. Aha. Watch this. There it is. I'd like to begin my historical comments by acknowledging today we live in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. I'll be telling stories tonight that are derived from European records and European cultures and European interests, while those records offer a reasonably coherent picture of the goals and expectations uh, of the colonists, we have only an incomplete understanding of the Wabanaki experience for these encounters. While we cannot remake history, we can learn from it, we can move forward with knowledge and respect. Maine's first ship has several projects underway in collaboration with representatives of the Wabanaki community to incorporate contemporary research into our, on Wabanaki culture into our own museum and exhibits, and we encourage additional such research through higher educational exhibits. Now, what I'd like to do, with the, how did the technology work? Let's try this. I'd like to show you, because some of this has been so recent, I'd like to show you four minutes of a video Hmm. Yeah. All right, we tried this before. I've worked this before. It says try again. We'll try it one more time. We're not going to do that. We're going to back away. And we're going to go forward. All right, so that's a beautiful picture of the ship that has been launched. That's a dawn picture, if any of you know the relationship of our dock to the, uh, to the sun. Actually, that's a morning picture. Um, yeah, that was a milestone of the project. Okay, we'll move right on, he said. This is one of those times when you're supposed to really practice. Okay, so the short version of the Popham colony is that in 1607, that's 416 years ago, 100 men left Plymouth, England and landed in the mouth of the Kennebec River. They built defenses, some dwellings, a chapel, a storeroom for the large supply of goods and materials that they brought with them. They sought out and traded with the Babanaki, the native persons that they encountered, and they built a small maneuverable ship with which to explore nearby rivers and coastlines. After 14 months, the colony folded. They rigged their new vessel for an ocean passage, and in company with the much larger supply vessel, they sailed it back to England. The successful effort of the Popham colonists to build and then sail across the Atlantic has long been overshadowed by their unsuccessful effort to establish a permanent English settlement at the work site. Instead, that honor went to Jamestown. But the ship they built there began the 400-year-old history of shipbuilding that we have here in Maine. As early as 1497, Henry VII of England had commissioned an Italian explorer, John Cabot, to sail west and look for a direct route to Asia. If you do that, you first reach Labrador, and then Newfoundland, and finally the St. Lawrence River, which penetrates deeply into the North American continent. Cabot's expeditionary discoveries were the basis for the English claim on North America. 
There were several other voyages of discovery before the start of the 17th century, primarily supported by France and focused on identifying a northwest passage to India, where trade in spices and sandalwood and various medicinal herbs was proving to be very lucrative. These motivations and the outcomes of several of these voyages are discussed in this book, Norm Bagan Navigators by Margaret Wilson. Last month, Mrs. Wilson spoke at our summer lecture series at Maine's First Ship, and there's a video of her talk on our website if you're interested in those activities. Finally, another major motivation for travel to North Atlantic waters was the, in the 1600s was the fishing. Fish was in big demand in predominantly Catholic uh, countries where roughly one third of the year was designated for fasting, which meant meatless days. French and Basque traders had made many trips across the North Atlantic by the start of the 17th century, and there were hundreds of European fishing vessels each summer working on the Grand Banks. No doubt a few of these men overwintered, if only by accident, but there wasn't a permanent settlement anywhere in North America until the founding of Quebec City in 1608. So let's go back to London in 1606. On your left is a portrait of Queen Elizabeth, who had reigned over England for 45 years, but had passed away three years before. She died childless and unmarried, which by definition at the time meant virginal. Our US state of Virginia, as well as the two ships that I'll be describing tonight were named after her. In the middle is James I, now he is King of England. On the right, is Philip II of Spain. Now, during her reign, Elizabeth focused much attention on solidifying Protestant rule over Britain and Ireland. But she also had to contend with the steady decline in relations with Spain. These had begun 40 years before, back at the time of her ascension as a Protestant queen to the English throne. She had refused a marriage proposal from Philip II Philip had not opposed her ascension to the English throne at the time. Apparently, he felt she owed him something for that gesture. Elizabeth did not agree. In 1570, she was excommunicated by Pope Pius V. That ban was renewed in 1585. That same year, active hostilities between the two countries broke out. Philip, encouraged by several successive popes, continued until his death in 1598 to make unsuccessful political intrigues and inconclusive military efforts to establish Catholic rule in England. The best known of those Spanish efforts is the invasion attempt by 112 warships that appeared in the English Channel in July of 1588. The English, commanded by Sir Charles Howe aboard this ship here, the Ark Royale, which is what the British call any ship that the monarch can sail on, and aided so by the so-called Protestant wind, which you see depicted in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, they decimated the Spanish Armada. By the time the Spanish fleet had been blown down the English Channel and had clawed its way back up and around the north and eastern coast of England and gotten back home to Parma, the score was 64-2, as measured in sunken ships. Although undeclared hostilities with Spain continued for the next 15 years after that battle, England took its place as a world-class power. Support for those late 16th century naval encounters was managed differently by England and Spain. Philip was able to spend, and eventually to exhaust, monies in his treasury that had been collected for many years from Spain's overseas colonies. From the 16th to the 18th century, two treasure fleets sailed each year, one from Mexico and the other from Central America, to collect goods and riches from the Americas, tons of silver from the mines of Peru and Mexico. The convoy system of sea routes that linked Spain and its territories to the Americas was the world's first permanent transatlantic trade route and was one of the most successful naval operations in history. Elizabeth, on the other hand, didn't have ready access to financing for war with Spain because she had to coordinate with Parliament, which was always reluctant to increase taxes. Instead, she issued letters of mark to self-financed seagoing entrepreneurs who were allowed to keep most of the captured Spanish goods whenever they found them. These privateers plundered both Spanish colonial settlements and the treasure ships and made huge fortunes for some names that are quite familiar to us as shown here. In 1604, James ended these expensive skirmishes by signing the Treaty of London. 
Its most important provisions were, one, Spain would recognize the Protestant monarchy of England, and two, England would end its disruption of Spanish shipping. James kept his word. He revoked all letters of mark, which had the immediate effect of turning all privateers into pirates. That, in turn, made many adventurous but unemployed seamen available for other projects, such as the establishment of overseas colonies. The Treaty of London made the Atlantic Ocean safe again, and English commercial interests soon returned to seeking valuable commodities along the coastline of the New World. Well, what attracted these commercial interests? I've already mentioned the demand for codfish. Furs were always in fashion. Mineral wealth was expected, and just look at what the Spanish had been getting out of Central America for the past 60 years. But lumber was important too, Pinus strobus. The eastern white pine grew straight, flexible, in old growth forests on the northeast coastline, rising 100 feet in the air, very suitable for making masts. By 1600, England had depleted much of its own mature forest land. The New World territories offered unlimited supplies of oak and pine, and wealthy merchants were interested in making such investments. And as we shall see, the Popham colony organizers added a unique marketing twist to encourage those interests. Those overseas commercial interests meshed well with what the geopolitical goals were that King James had in the New World. He wanted to enforce English territorial claims and block encroachment from the Spanish and the French. But, like Elizabeth before him, he didn't want to argue with Parliament about using public money. So, like Elizabeth before him, he turned to entrepreneurs. In the spring of 1606, James established a land use charter for the Virginia Company to establish two permanent settlements in North America. In turn, the company created two investment structures. One was based in London. The other was based in Plymouth. Investors could support one or the other or both of these if they cared to. The London-based colony would go to land we now call Virginia and North Carolina. The Plymouth-based company would locate in what we call New England. The overlapping middle ground would go to whichever settlement was strong enough to claim it. The companies were instructed to settle at least 100 miles apart near the mouth of a major river that would give access to the interior and at a site that would be hidden from passing French and Spanish ships. The principal backer of the Plymouth Colony was Sir John Popham, the Lord Chief Justice of England. That's basically the Supreme Court at the time. The other primary backer was Sir John Gilbert. The company had two ships. One was owned by the Popham Colony uh, family, the other was owned by the Gilbert family. These two families, along with other investors and business leaders, were colleagues and friends who had benefited greatly from decades of maritime and political experience. And so it was that in December of 1606, three ships of the Southern Colony, Godspeed, Susan Constant, and the Discovery, left London and reached the New World in late April of 1607. On the May 14th of that year, they landed at a defensible site on the James River. They named their settlement Jamestown. We know why, in honor of the king, keep him on your side. It struggled, but it survived to become the first permanent English settlement in, the North, in North America. This slide shows modern reconstructions of those three ships that are docked at present day Jamestown. On May 31st of that same year, 1607, the two ships of the North Colony, the Mary and John, and the Gift of God, left Plymouth and some 60 days later made landfall in Nova Scotia. They proceeded west along the coastline to the mouth of the Kennebec River, and by August 16th were anchored off Sabino Point, a stubby little peninsula, the arrow there shows that, a stubby peninsula that projects out into Atkins Bay. That was just three months after the Jamestown landing. George Popham, nephew of Sir John Popham, was named president of the colony, which the colonies, colonists themselves named Fort St. George. In time, this has come to be called the Popham Colony. There are several historical records, European records, available to us that discuss the Popham Colony, the most detailed of which is a journal written by James Davies, the navigator of Mary and John. It begins when the ship left Plymouth, and it runs through early October when that ship returned, as had been planned, to England. This is a speculative drawing by Sam Manning of what Fort St. George might have looked like in October of 1607. 
The settlers had cleared trees, built defenses, protective ditches with urban barriers in them, rocks and dirt, uh, enough to keep out predators and neighbors. They built simple living quarters and a forge and a chapel and a storehouse to protect all the many supplies they had brought with them, some of them related to the boat that we're going to speak about. They would be used to build a yada yada. In one of the letters sent home to his investors, President Popham reported that a Mr. Digby and some men had begun building a pretty pinnace, a pinnace, we'll speak about a pinnace, a ship of some 30 ton. The word pretty in this sense meant sturdy or reliable at the time. You can see this effort underway in the lower right hand corner of the slide. Okay, they're building a ship down there. We know very little about the daily workings of the colony. The, the men seem to have been skilled laborers with a collective knowledge of carpentry and stonework and blacksmithing and shipbuilding. They were hired to perform certain tasks. They had no intention of staying in the new world. We call them our colonists, but our historian Ken Borgendale calls them the crew of Fort St. George. I like to compare them to World War II Seabees, you know, the construction battalions the U.S. Navy formed in 1941 uh, after the, to repair the damage of the attack on Pearl Harbor. We can also safely assume that back in England, Digby had recruited a good crew of workers for his operation. We don't know how many there were. Skilled woodworkers would probably have brought their own tools, as many as Maine's first ship volunteers do today. The transport ships carried the sails and the lines and the hardware necessary to outfit Virginia once she was constructed. These men weren't testing their ability to build a ship. They knew how to do that. They were demonstrating that here on the main coast were resources that would allow England to maintain its dominance in all matters nautical. Building Virginia was an objective, not a byproduct, of the Popham colony. We can move quickly through the remaining history of the Popham colony because we don't know much about it. The Mary and John left Popham on October 8th, 1607, carrying a hopeful letter to King James, stating that while some useful medicinal herbs such as sassafras had been identified, but the mining expeditions hadn't yielded much. They were looking for the gold, remember? Nor had trading with the Wabanaki, but things still looked pretty good. Popham then delayed the return of the gift of God after all, it was his family ship, he could do that, to help protect the colony from possible French discovery. As winter approached, the threat from the French seemed less probable, while the threat from the weather increased. The gift of God encountered problems with ice flows in the river, and the colonists were running low on food. When the ship finally left in mid-December, Popham sent half of the colonists back to England as a way to conserve supplies. During the winter, the colonists' problems continued to mount. In February, President Popham died of unknown causes, and a young Raleigh Gilbert took over the leadership. Gilbert's immediate problem was the winter. Bath is located at latitude 43.9 degrees north. If you follow the 44th parallel across the Atlantic, you come to Bordeaux on the Mediterranean. Winters are not bad there. That's probably what the colonists expected. The early 17th century experienced weather so, weather so cold in both Europe and North America that it's been called the Little Ice Age. I guess that was on the previous slide, wasn't it? I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, as you can see in this graph, it says there. So anyway, it was a difficult time, but we have no contemporary accounts of it, for either from, uh, from North America or how Digby or his crew handled it. But spring eventually came, and next thing we know for sure is that the Mary and John returned to, August, or to Popham in August, of 1608, carrying news that the colony was to be abandoned. Why was this settlement effort, why it failed would be a good topic for our question and answer session, but our focus tonight is on the ship. By late summer, the builders completed their work. They named her Virginia of Sagadahawk. Sagadahawk is the Abenaki term for mouth of a big river. She was then rigged for an ocean voyage. Someone could ask me about what that means. And in mid-October of 1608, in the company with Mary and John, she sailed back to England. The Virginia appears twice more in the colonial record before being lost to history. Soon after she returned to England, the Plymouth colony sold her to the London colony for use in Jamestown. 
So in June of 1609, Virginia joined a convoy of resupply ships headed back across the Atlantic. She was last recorded of having been on a fishing expedition in Jamestown Bay. The reason I show this slide again, it gives you a size comparison among the ships. The Discovery replica, which is the smallest ship you see there, was rated at 20 tons and 38 feet long. So the Godspeed at the end is 40 tons and about 68 feet, while Susan Constant was 120 and 116 feet overall. Virginia, the ship we're going to show, I'm going to show you, was 30 tons, sort of midway between those two smaller vessels. This is James Stevens of Phippsburg. In 1983, she moved into her childhood home on the eastern side of Sabino Point. Half of her house is on the footprint of the Fort St. George site. For many years, she had heard local stories about English colonists who came and built a ship there before the pilgrims. Jane contacted Dr. Jeffrey Brain, an archeologist at the Peabody Institute in Salem. It's my friends from Salem here. That's Brain there, Jeff Brain holding a stadia rod in her side yard. And working with volunteers and dedicated supervisors and school students between 1997 and 2013, Dr. Brain excavated her available property. Their excavation unearthed a variety of 16th century artifacts of European origin, including on the left, a rusted caulking iron, which is a definitive shipbuilding tool, and on the right, an English shilling. The excavations confirmed the existence of the Popham colony and supported much of what we read in the historical record. These artifacts are on display in the Maine State Museum in Augusta, and Maine's first ship has replicas and pictures of several of them in our Jane Stevens Exhibit Center at the Bath Freight Shed. One of the primary sources used by Dr. Brain was a map of Fort St. George that was found in 1888 in an archival museum in Spain. Now there's a lot of information on this map, including the location of several buildings that were found to be concordant with the archeological remains that were located on the worksite. We could discuss this map more in the Q&A session, but for now I want to draw your attention to the left edge of the map. A common device used by map makers, both then and now, to indicate a body of water is to draw a ship floating in it. Here's a sketch of a small sailing vessel, a single-decked, high-sided, shallow draft, square stern hull with a spritzel and a headsel. That drawing became the basis for our Virginia. That constitutes the history lesson. Now let's build a ship. From its beginning, the intent of the Virginia project, that was the name, original name of Maine's first ship, was to research, design, construct, and operate as historically accurate a 17th century ship as could be built today, but to receive also a, an operating license from the Coast Guard. Starting in 1997, a two-phase research program was started that would lay the groundwork for the actual ship construction. The first phase was to develop a historical concept design using pictures and descriptions that were available in the literature. There's little documentation for any ship that was constructed 400 years ago. Ship design in that era was valuable intellectual property, like nautical charts or productive fishing grounds. Shipbuilding techniques were carefully guarded secrets. John Bradford, a historian who worked for many years on the Virginia Project, described the pinnace as a relatively fast, lightly constructed, shallow draft support vessel for fishing, trading, exploring, cargo carrying, with a distinctive square or flat transom. They were open deck work boats, common on English rivers and coastal waterways at the time. This is an engraving of ships on the Thames about mid 17th century. I've circled a pinnace in it and there's two others that you could find. The working design for our Virginia was the result of several years of library research and collaboration between early MFS board members and nautical historians in this country and in England. There was a lot of background work by several individuals, but the primary person who developed this design and a complete set of build blueprints to build the ship itself was David Wyman, an independent naval architect and professor of marine engineering at the Maine Maritime Academy. Don't have the next slide, so we'll skip that phrase. Okay, by 2010, the Virginia Project had raised enough money to enter into a lease agreement for the property between the freight shed, if you've been there, and the river. 
You begin by build, to build a ship by laying its keel, which is oak, purchased from a commercial yard in Connecticut that specialized in milling timbers from blowdowns and landscaping projects. And lifting that keel up, laying it on those base blocks, really gave us something to celebrate. The year was 2011. Now I've focused this talk on hull construction. I will leave rigging discussions, that's sails and masts and all the lines needed to control a ship for a later presentation. So you gotta invite me back. So here's that working profile again, but now I've taken the rigging off. Some of you may not be unfamiliar with ship construction. That's what my notes here tell me to say, but that's probably not true for this audience. But in case there is anyone, here's that same outward profile without rigging. The major components of a ship's hull are the keel, the stem, the frames, the keelson, which is inside the ship, the clamps, which are also inside, the transom, the planking, the deck, and the rudder. I've put a small copy of this diagram in the corner of some of my slides to help orient you. If I do slip and use some unfamiliar nautical terminology, just remember that the process is really that a large ship is being assembled from little pieces of wood. <laughs> the first component that we built was the stem. The stem forms the forward, upward curving part of the ship's backbone. It's assembled from three large pieces of five inch thick white oak whose dimensions are specified in the blueprints that we spoke of. Then that gets attached to the keel. The process by which information in the blueprints is transferred to pieces of wood is called lofting. Lofting involves drawing out in full size one surface of each piece of wood to be assembled. In this slide, the full scale drawings of the stem are being spread out on the floor of the freight shed and the outlines of the stem pieces are transferred to thin pieces of plywood. The plywood patterns are then traced onto five inch thick pieces of white oak and cut out on a bandsaw. This process is similar to that would be used by a seamstress to pattern a piece of clothing before sewing it together. Here's the assembled stem pieces being raised into position at the forward end of the keel. In the background, you can see the end wall of a large hoop tent that we built to protect the ship and our volunteers from the main weather. Here's the stem being bolted to the keel. Next, we need to build the frames. These are the curved ribs that support the hull and give the ship its shape and strength. Again, the design blueprints give us the size and shape of the frames. That's their upper and lower ends and bevels and various arcs and diagonals between those points of each frame. But there are no trees in England, or in New England, wide enough to allow cutting of the full arc of a frame that's called for in the blueprint. So the frames are made by assembling smaller pieces of wood called futtocks. By assembling several short pieces of straight grained wood, we allow those much stronger straight grained wood pieces to follow more closely the curve of the frame. Here's a pile of futtocks ready to be assembled into frames. Now let's discuss the structure and positioning of the frames. In this overhead view of the deck, the tops of the frames are shown as those rows of dots that surround the ship diagram. The bow of the ship is to your right. Each dot represents the upper end of a frame. Each frame is doubled. That is, each frame consists of two sets of futtocks. I'll show you how that works in a minute. Virginia has 38 frames, 32 of which are transverse frames. That means they're set up perpendicular to the keel and they go in the, in the aft and the middle part of the ship. So they go from one side to the other. There's also six frames of, called cant frames, as in cantilever, uh, up there at the bow, close together. That is angled forward to provide support for the forward end of the ship. The size and shape of each frame is specified and is assigned by its assigned position along the ship's keel, and taken together, they determine the size and shape of the hull. The frames are built as half frames, each half frame being a mirror image of its partner. These workers are holding a half frame. That is one rib that will go on either the port or the starboard side of the ship. The opposite half is the other half frame resting right there at their feet. Notice that both half frames are themselves made from two nearly identical assemblies. Each assembly can consist up to nine futtocks, although the one that's here looks like perhaps it's made of only about five of them. In order to hold the futtocks together, they're positioned so that the ends of one futtock meet the end of the next one in line at a point near the center of the futtock on the other assembly. 
That sounds confusing. But if you look at the little green diagram, sketch up the upper right, you'll get the idea. You don't want the ends to overlap. You want them to be meeting in the middle of the next opposite futtock. So these futtocks then are held together by wooden pegs called trunnels, which are pounded through sideways. You can see those bumps, the ends of the trunnels, protruding along the length of both half frames. Here's the first full frame that was completed. It's called the midship bend. That's the nautical name given to the widest frame of a ship, although Virginia has five frames of the same width, but you have to start somewhere. The midship bend is the first frame to be set up on the keel, and the other frames are measured and numbered forward and aft from that one. Here's the ship with seven of its transverse frames mounted into position. They're temporarily stabilized by short braces between them, as well as by pieces of wood that span the gap at the upper ends until they can be properly attached to the keel. As we move farther aft, the shape of the individual frames change. This photo nicely shows the reverse curve of some of them as we approach the aft end of the ship. One of the most, uh, when most of the transverse frames are mounted, <clears throat> but before all the cant frames are in, it's time to bind them together with a keelson. Our keelson consists of two blocks of wood that rest on top of the keel with notches in them so they'll fit tightly over the frames. See that little small diagram in the upper left of the slide? It's, it's oriented fore and aft. You're looking down the length of the keel. The keelson rests above the keel on the inside of the ship. To make a keelson, you square up two large pieces of oak. And then you run them around the parking lot, down the ship street to the front end of the ship. And then you use a pulley system to haul them in over the bow. In this photo, the aft section behind where I would be is already in place. Um, I've circled the forward end of the aft section in red where these two pieces will be joined together by what's called a scarf joint. Since the perspective in this picture is a bit odd, here's a side view of the two workers preparing the aft section of the keelson to receive that incoming forward section into which a matching joint will be cut. This is all hand work done to a remarkable level of precision on massive pieces of wood. The keelson pieces are turned over so that notches can be chiseled into their lower surface to fit over the frames. Holes are drilled for silicon bronze connecting rods that will bind the keelson to the keel. The connecting rods are pounded home and secured tightly from below. So that gives you some feeling of how Rob Stevens, our shipwright, got the vessel built. Working with large unwieldy pieces of wood with an all-volunteer crew with differing skill levels and unpredictable family schedules, retirees, young men and women from local schools, and from the nearby Navy base, Wednesdays and Saturdays from 9 to 3, Rob and Virginia made steady progress for over a decade. It's quite a commitment. We couldn't have done it without him. Meanwhile, at the other end of the ship, the stern post and other supporting pieces are being fitted to the keel. Here's one of the transom supports being hoisted up into position. Then the pre-assembled transom piece can be fitted into place. When the framing is completed, she looks like a wicker basket. Now we need to give that basket strength and stability. Horizontal stability is provided by installing six rows of beams inside the ship on both sides. Each row is made of three pieces of white oak, 23 to 25 feet long, six to 12 inches wide, two and a quarter inches thick. They get fastened port and starboard in both the bilge area that is low down near the keel, and also near the shear at the upper ends of the frames. Mounting these horizontal pieces presents two difficulties. The first is that for a clamp to fit properly on a frame, it must have its inboard surface positioned in line with its neighbors. In this slide, you see a worker using a long batten to see if the inside faces of the frames line up along a smooth curve. He slides the batten up and down and left and right making corrections when necessary. Sometimes he has to grind away the inner surface of a frame. Less often, he may epoxy on a shim, a, a thin piece of oak, to raise the surface of the frame to some point so that a clamp will fit smoothly to it. This process of evening up the neighboring surfaces is called fairing. 
The other difficulty posed by the clamps is that many of them, particularly those up at the forward end, have to fit a curved surface. And for that to happen, they have to bend. Once a clamp was cut to the correct length, planed to the correct thickness, we'd throw it in the river for three or four days, then put the forward end into a long wooden steam box. Steam from an old rug cleaner, that's that yellow device in the background, would be directed into the box. After about four hours, the board would be pulled out of the steam box and carried into the boat shed, where it would be handed up over through the transom and brought inside and forced into place using hand clamps and brute strength. You have about 20 minutes before the wood dries, after which it will retain most of the curve that's been forced into it so that a subsequent work session will allow it to be drilled and attached to the frames by trunnels, just as the double sawn frames had been assembled. For additional strength, the clamps were also fastened to the frames at several points with stainless steel lag bolts. This picture shows the forward end of the ship after both the port and starboard set of bilge clamps have been installed. This picture shows work on the shear clamps at the forward end. That's this business here, okay? We have the lower ones, you can't really see them up here, shear clamps. Um, same procedure, of course, is being done all along the midline and the aft end of the hull as well. Now let's shift to the outside of the ship. Horizontal members mounted on the outside of the hull are called planks. Since their job is to keep water out, they have the same requirement of having to fit closely to their neighbors and follow a smooth curve along the length of the ship. So the outside of the frames need fairing as well. The process of steaming and mounting the planks is the same as was done for the clamps. Here's a hot plank going in onto a lower section on the starboard side and hopefully and hopefully was written into my text, but this time I really mean it. Hopefully I can show you a video of that process. That's about it. Okay. The planks, wasn't that pretty good? I thought that went well. I mean, thank you for the technology support there. The planks and the clamps are attached to the frame by trunnels, just like the frames were. Trunnels are one inch thick, 12 inch long pegs of locust wood. Locust is denser than oak, so that when the ship is put in the water and the oak will swell and clamp down even more tightly onto that. Trunnels are driven in pre-drilled holes using a 12 pound sledge. It's worked best done by young buff Navy seamen like this fellow, instead of old folks like me, but sometimes those young ponies just aren't around. <laughs> this picture shows the high degree of curvature that's needed for planks to get mounted at the bow. We cracked a few of them, I'll admit, early on, until we worked out the timing and the procedures for steaming and bending the wood. Once the ship was fully planked, the next step was to caulk it. Because we wanted the caulking to be done well, particularly below the waterline, we hired a professional caulker to do the job. Actually, the Coast Guard encouraged this as well. <laughs> Using a large mallet and caulking irons of varying sizes, he's got a caulking iron in his hand, he forced cotton into the gaps between the planks. Of course, the colonists wouldn't have had cotton in 1607, but they would have made use of some other plant fiber. Then he pounded in oakum which is a tar-treated hemp product that the colonists probably brought with them. With the caulking complete, we're pretty sure she'll be watertight. She is. The seams were then painted and sealed with a putty made of pitch and waxy cement. The hull was then sanded in preparation for it to be painted. The next step was to shape and install the deck beams. This picture shows how these large four-inch thick beams have been cut to a camber a, a curve to keep the rainwater off the deck and mortised into the shear clamps into each other to provide a really solid structure. 
Here's a below deck view looking aft. The full deck beam is attached to a hull framed by right angled blocks of wood called knees. You can see two of them there just behind the yellow power cord on the right. A hanging knee is positioned vertically. A lodging knee is, is installed horizontally. The knees are fashioned from the roots of a hackmatack tree, a member of the larch family. The normal growth pattern of a hackmatack root system forms a sturdy right angle bend, much stronger than any nailed or glued joint could ever be. Shipbuilders have been using hackmatack roots for over 400 years to give rigidity to deck frames and other structural members of wooden ships. The deck framing for Virginia, for Virginia required 48 of these hand-fashioned hackmatack knees. Here's a view of the deck looking aft after it was fully planked with white pine. The upper bulwark frames, that's the wall on either side, will also be planked with pine. Work on Virginia slowed considerably when the pandemic came to Maine. Many volunteers stopped coming. We opened the work site five days a week to our volunteers, but divided the crews into different shifts instead of just inviting folks to show up whenever they wanted. Work continued in small, socially distant groups who had coordinated their work at times of their own choosing. We also took advantage of COVID downtime to get permits for and to build a wharf for Virginia right next to the freight shed. These next two slides show the rather heroic efforts achieved by just three volunteers working alone during the pandemic. You see here the starboard side of the vessel at the aft end of the ship. Those are two mold poured lead ballast blocks each weighing 3,000 pounds. Six of them placed end to end provide external ballast for the ship. Each was jacked up by hand, braced, and then drilled down from above, new holes through the keelson, through the frame, through the keel, and finally through the lead and fashioned from below. Here you can see you're looking aft now along the starboard side of the all fitted into position. Late last summer, a shiny new Coast Guard required diesel engine was installed, a 175 horsepower Volvo Penta. Work proceeded on several pieces of deck equipment. This is just one hand piece of Fred's handiwork. It's a windlass. It's positioned so it can raise both the anchor and hoist the main yard, though not, of course, at the same time. You can see one handle, but it would normally be worked with two. Maybe you can see two in that. Each was square end handle they would put into the exposed holes, press down, and then remove once that wooden pawl, that's that center piece here, once the thing had rotated and this would drop down and hold position on the uh, taut line. This is one of three night heads, turning blocks, night heads are turning blocks into which halyards are run. Halyards come down along the mast. They're supporting, the, they're raising the sails. They're led through the windlass. This one is for the main halyard and Rob admits that the carving might bear some resemblance. He complains about the nose. Yeah, he complains about the nose. Last fall, we sanded the hull and painted the bottom before cold weather set in. Here's two views, fore and aft, of Virginia with her bottom paint. In the aft view on the right, you can see the propeller shaft protruding from the keel. Finally, here's the rudder being installed. And here's the rudder after it was painted. Okay, it says here, emotional break. Take a deep breath. Jane Stevens passed away in 2008, but her dream lives on. Here is Virginia resting safely at her wharf by the freight shed. We'll spend this summer rigging the ship, fitting her out, conducting sea trials, and learning how to sail her. She'll have to pass several Coast Guard inspections and stability trials in order for her to carry paying passengers. While Virginia won't be publicly operational until next summer, we're already expanding our land-based educational curricula and exhibits. Once more space becomes available in the freight shed, we'll be able to restart our youth boat building school. And in time, we hope to offer maritime topics such as tool making, ship design, lofting, and rigging. We'll expand our annual women's shipbuilding day to last at least a week. Once at sea, we can offer sail handling, 
navigation, other marine sciences, and the ship will be available for river tours and other summer sailing experiences. Lori isn't in this room, Lori Benson. I keep saying, let's do weddings. And she says, no, 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 don't talk about weddings. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. Don't tell her that I said it. Currently, we're offering free lecture series, both in person and remotely using Zoom. This coming Thursday, Nick Hardesty, the historian from the Tall Ships Association, will talk about some of their sea education programs. That will be all on Zoom. I heard a couple of days ago, uh, he can't come in person to our freight shed because of some uh, problems with uh, complications with his some medical complications that his wife has in a pregnancy. So at any rate, that's why he's not there. It's on Zoom. Come watch it on Zoom. And he'll talk about uh, leadership development, preservation of our own maritime heritage. And Nick should have some really spectacular photographs to share with us. In summary, it's unlikely that the Popham investors sent Digby to build just one vessel. In their proposals to King James, they clearly stated their belief that shipbuilding and its supporting trades were well suited for the new world and should be encouraged. The founders of Fort St. George expected fully that in time, a sustainable colony would grow up around it. Although abandoned after just one year, the Popham colony was a building block in the English colonization of this continent and an instructive precursor to the Plymouth colony that came eight years later. We recognize that it also played an early role in the devastating impact Europeans had on the lives of the Abenaki people. The significance of the Popham colony should be understood in all of these contexts. Building on the colony's history, Maine's first ship has constructed this early seagoing vessel with a reasonably accurate 17th century hull and rig design that we think will be a well suited to the inshore environment in which we plan to use her. So we're developing our museum and educational center to promote an appreciation for Maine's maritime heritage and an understanding of both the history of the Popham Colony and the relationship to the Wabanaki people. We're also preserving the Bath Freight Shed as a home for Virginia and a site for community activities in Bath. We welcome your participation in this exciting venture. Become a member of Maine's first ship, or to donate, as you said, or volunteer, as you also said, for one of our projects, please write Maine's first ship. 27 Commercial Street in Bath, and come by whenever you see the flag of St. George flying. And this little, this is a picture from our display we had at Mystic Seaport several years ago. I just love it. <laughs> she's, they have a built building class for children, and she's got her boat, but you know what she's looking at? She says, I can do this. <laughs> Thank you. I, I came in 2012, um, but there were many people before that, particularly the archaeology crew. It was, and, and I have looked at early pictures from that time, which are on our Facebook page, and I, I only recognize two or three people. So there were many people that aren't there at the end. I mean, people, we age out, unfortunately, you know? Uh, or they move, or there's some are people, and they, some don't come back. I mean, I, I think that's probably a good guess. We have a mailing list of about 400 that we send things to. Uh, I expect most of them have some connection to the ship in the past, but it's been, a, it's been a consistent large number. We've had some people that drive all the way up from Massachusetts somewhere in Beverly area, I think, on a weekend and spend the day and, and, and go back, so. Yes, so, Julia, I, I, just. Did they build any vessels at Plymouth? No, not that I know of. They may, may have built small, small boats. One, one, one thing on this small shallop, many of the large ships that came over, you saw how big the Susan Constant was, they would bring a couple of ships disassembled or they'd build the hull part, leave the rest to be finished when they got in place. And so you'd get the basic boats because they needed boats to go ashore. They needed dinghies. You know, they, they needed this ability to move around. I don't have any record, but again, we have the records from the top level managers, the Governor Bradfords and the various people who, who did that level of history. Uh, history. Um, hard, to, hard to say, I would expect that boat building began 
as soon as someone wanted to get from here to there and didn't want to swim. So, which I'm in that same category. So I, I, the Mayflower did bring a set shallot on board. Right, but they and didn't then use the local resources yeah. the way they did it. And, and finish it out. To do that, they would have had to bring the tools. That had to be done intentionally. This wouldn't have happened accidentally with a bunch of guys sitting around saying, hey, let, let's build a ship. You know, I mean, this was very much of a, of a plan uh, uh, in, in the program. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Has anyone investigated what the second ship built in the colonies was? <clears throat> You've got one. I can tell you, let me vary that comment. We are the oldest ship, second oldest shipbuilding company on the Kennebec River. Yeah. Okay? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would expect that small boats have been built all along, as I said. But you're talking about a, an ocean-going vessel. I would expect that it might have been the Dutch. What, what the English didn't realize in all this time, 1608, was when Henry Hudson snuck up the Hudson River and started saying, you know, this is a pretty good place to start a colony. And there was a variety of communications back in England, largely among men and no women, I guess, who'd never been to the country, as to how to parcel all this land up and how to protect it from some parts or the other. So I expect that certainly repairs went on, and uh, I would guess that it was probably a Dutch vessel, because they were supporting trade and they were supporting fishing, and, and those boats were not, you know, you could build an, a fishing vessel that didn't have to be too sturdy, it just had to work and build another two years later. Did he really? Yeah. I think it was pretty well known. As I say, the fishing vessels had been coming here for a long time, and I'm sure there were wrecks we didn't know about and partial wrecks. That, uh, what was the date of the Gabriel, Fred? 35. Okay, so a couple of uh, 20 years later. But, but my, the general pattern is that ships have been running aground here, but they've been coming here. They had been coming here. They hadn't been coming here for this purpose. Uh, and uh, so, yes. Where yes, sir. Does, where does Hackensack grow? Well, uh, Fred, you may know that as, as well. I think more Nova Scotia, Canada areas. We're, we're right into southern edge of the main. We've got, I've got a couple of stumps from uh, contributory uh, property. Uh, but we're right into the southern edge of the main. Yeah. 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 There used to be in Maine a man named Newton who sadly died harvesting the Hackensack. But he cut all those knees. So oh, is that right? Knees around. Yeah. yeah. Knees yeah. hit by the knees that we got were within 10 miles of this farm. Yeah. In May. In May. Yeah. In May. There's a spot we ever saw. St. Albans. St. Albans. Okay. Yeah. There's half attack all over May. It's all going all on the kind of a finish. Yeah, I'm just saying it's somewhere around. Yeah, but, but, but not large trees anymore, are there? I mean, I don't, I don't really yeah. know. And that's yeah. something to remember is that at that time, the environment was different and the resources were different. Yeah. There were, there, it, this was virgin forest yeah. and there were, there were chestnut trees, which yeah. we don't have anymore. So, so there were, have, I, I know, I've got one growing too. We are going to have. Oh, okay, keep it going. Well, I have a slide, I did include it in there, in here, uh, making the knee for the uh, connection between the keel and the transom, okay? And Jeremy Blakelock is approaching this gigantic stump as high as he is with a helmet on and a chainsaw. <laughs> and he's about to carve out the size of, the, of the, what became the knee there at the end of the, uh, of the stem. So you, you, need a big, you need a big tree to do that. I am not a forester. Oh, really? Tam yeah, tamarack is the is another term for it. Well, the larch is a larger family with other trees in it, I think. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, that's it. Any other questions on ships or yes, sir? Uh, no, no CAD. This wasn't, this wasn't CAD time. This was 20, 25 years ago when this was being put together. Yes, a model was built. <clears throat> you can see that model in our freight shed. It was primarily built, 
it was primarily built to handle and to figure out the rigging. The rigging was what wasn't understood. The, the ship hulls were, were known. Uh, and the cal- I'm sure it's understood, Well, <laughs> it, yes, it isn't. Uh, if you, we took a close look at the ship at the wharf, you'll see that there was only one mast up there and a few lines hanging down. So it's not ready to sail yet. But yes, there was a model built and that helped quite a bit. Um, that model, um, I don't think, with, the, the ship ended up somewhat different than the model. Uh, there were modifications in between. There were some things that had to be altered in, in various ways. But yeah, I think that's, you, you, gotta, you wanna get something in front of you that you can walk around and look at and, and measure. Yes? I just wanted to, to recognize the fact that because this is an, an antique, archaic rig, learning to sail it is gonna be a challenge. And finding a captain certified captain that knows how to sail this is going to be a challenge. Um, so I just wanted to put it out into the public. We know anybody that is qualified to do this to let us know because uh, it's going to be a challenge to find that person. Well, that's partly one of the th reasons I'm pushing our membership. We couldn't join the organization until the ship floated and now we can. And uh, the board is going to have to cough up 600 bucks a year in order to do that. But I think the resources available, this is a bias I'm going to make on Thursday night when Nick speaks. Uh, we, we do want to plug ourselves into other organizations, and that's the primary one for contacting and communicating among the... Uh, and there's a lot of paperwork. We have to write operational manuals, fire extinguishers. How would you train your people? Uh, where are communication manuals, that sort of thing. All of that needs to be put together. There is another ship, the Sultana, down in the uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay, which is somewhat close to our size and our shape. And many of these boats, uh, these boats, these ships have already provided us with documents that they put together. And so and there's quite a community and we definitely want to join that community. And now we're able to do that. Yes. Well, you know, uh, again, there may be people, but I'm not a nautical architect, but I guess the, the original discussion was you wanted a boat that had a head like a cod and a tail like a mackerel, all right? There wasn't much understanding of sleekness, but then when you're only going three or four knots, you're aiming that a little bit better isn't really gonna make you go faster. And I also couldn't calculate out what a, uh, a hull speed would be, but it's not gonna be very fast. So uh, I, I, can't, I can't really speak to what the design was. I think they were trying to match the, design, match the designs that they saw. And some of those were maximized for volume carrying. They were moving goods and you know, they weren't moving it fast. Time was much less important. They could get things from here to there. So, uh, but there may be points on that in, in some discussions in Bradford's book. I, I left out a slide describing the book that was written including the descriptions of how to do this boat. It's for sale in our, our uh, uh, shop, our, our freight shed, uh, and it goes quite nicely through. There's maybe five or six pages of history, which everybody reads, and then there's all these diagrams for both the hull and the rigging, which most people don't read because they don't have to, and they're at a level of arcs and diagrams and whatever diagonals that people get very swamped after they've bought this $30 book and realize that there's only six or seven pages that they're gonna read in it because we're not gonna build another one of these, so. But other people do know how to do this. Yes, sir, in the back. Well, there have been a lot of discussion about that. Um, once the uh, wars on the sea, the international wars stopped, one of the things you'd like to be able to do is to recognize your ship as, you, as it was coming into the harbor and you'd get people ready and you'd know, it, depending on how long it had been out for a while. So an identification, if you had a chance to see the Mayflower when she was launched about a year ago now, gorgeous, reds and greens and pastels and everything, it was a, it was a signal. Yeah, if you put a little tiny flag up and it, you know, nobody knows that ship, it looks like every other one. But if you paint yours bright green, uh, you know it and your mother will know it when you're coming home. I mean, I don't think there's anything more than that. And the chevrons, the pictures were actually taken from some drawings or paintings made from the Spanish Armada that were decorated that same way. I don't think all of the ships were. 
but in this particular, and probably, I don't know, Fred, I don't think the original ship would have chevrons on it, but they would have put some sort of protective coating on it, and they could have colored it with the, there was a great discussion of the, whether we should have red chevrons or whether we should have black chevrons, and what was available at the time, iron ore based sand or mud that you could make a paint out of. I stayed out of those discussions pretty much, but I think it looks pretty. Yes? I apologize if you said this and I missed it, but do we know how many people in 60763 were actually involved in the building of the ship? Well, no, actually, I, went, I didn't show a slide which I made when I spoke to a historical society at the Salem Athenaeum. No, at, at the bath, because I got shot down by it. I had invented a work order, a list of work. So you got a hundred men, all right? And five or six of them are probably malingering or injured or somewhere. So you're down to 95 and then there are five managers and, and leaders and they aren't working. And then you've got somebody who's got to go cook a fire and cook you know, two or three for that. And pretty soon you have some people who are supposed to be working on the defenses. And you, you can get down fairly quickly to a number where there's not a whole lot of people if you've got them building a house at the same time. And, and uh, I would say 10, 12 would probably, you know, it, lots of times you don't need that many people. You saw you only need four people to carry in a plank and put it up there. There were two or three other people on the side of the ship. And so what is it the Marines say? I, I'd rather have four good men, and, uh, yeah, and excuse me, we could have women now, we have women on our shipbuilding, but nonetheless, you wanna have people who are dedicated and know what they're doing. Uh, there's some nice texts that describe work conditions more recently than this, but in, in England, say at the beginning, at the turn of the uh, 1800s to 1900s, we can get some descriptions of how some of these yards worked. Um, and they brought in young boys and trained them over years and gradually grew up in one of the skills sailing, uh, making sails, or shaping wood, or whatever it happens to be. They didn't have that opportunity. They didn't have a large staff to draw on, and so they probably brought skilled people. They needed to have blacksmiths. They needed to have metal workers. They, and they had very good wood workers. They established, our, that map shows, well, I didn't go into detail on the map. There's all sorts of good, good stories there, but the fact that they had the buildings that were in concordance with the map, somebody had planned this discussion, and, and they, at any rate, they had some skilled folks. Uh, and I would think that, yeah, there are a few names in what they do, but I, I think they're, you know, workmen generally, sailor. Not everybody was necessarily a sailor either. I mean, they, they came on board. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. No, I, I, what I, I, well, I think what I said was they changed the rigging for an ocean voyage. Was that the point? Okay. So if you are sailing and you want to steer to the left and the right and go up a river and that sort of thing, you want to have what's called a fore and aft sail that can be adjusted to either side of the ship. All right. And uh, most of the boats that you see out here sailing by have that ability. If you want to sit on an ocean swell with the wind behind you for 65 days, uh, it's a whole lot better from a balance point of view to have a nice big bellied sail in the front. And so they had three nice big bellied sail in the front and the wind just blows you across the ocean. That's the idea. The trade winds, there are consistent winds that blow. And after the Spanish knew exactly, well, they knew pretty well where to go. And the English learned later on how to make a, a route. So you do this with large, tall ship sails, and those are the ones you see in the pictures and the movies, and they're all very pretty. That ship couldn't turn and go into Pemaquid Harbor, though, and it couldn't avoid, end up, never get into anywhere else. So the question was, what would we build? We build them both. We build them both. Yeah. So our, our ship is designed to have those. And in fact, many of the tall ships will take down those spars when they get low, close to the coastline and put up the sails or the, in our case, a Latin rig, an angled sail, where they could have maneuverability. So it was a, it's a design. They had to choose one or the other pretty much. Yes? I'm hoping this is a more general question. Do we know if the original ship or ships of that era had a uh, lead ballast? 
had, had things out exterior? Exterior, no. No, I'm sure they would have carried rocks, cobblestones, large cobblestones. Okay, I mean, um, there are, I was just reading, what was I reading? Oh, about Charles Wilkes's uh, expedition to the Pacific in 1848, and they had some ships that, that uh, grounded on the Columbia Bar, the bar off the Columbia River in, in uh, Oregon, and uh, they had sand coming through these cracks. So, I mean, they didn't have ballast and rocks to move out of the way. They, just, they saw this stuff coming in. So perhaps at that point it was the cargo that gave it the ballast. If, no, but these, well, we don't know what they decided, okay. Um, there's no descriptions of what sh fitting out the ship are. Nobody wrote that down in a manner that was written in the histories. The histories, you remember, were written by the uh, merchants, the investors, some to protect some of their interests, some to promote. There were some court ca cases after the ships came back. And from those records, we can get some indication from commentary as to what went on. But the diarist did not come back when he came back with Mary and John. So we just, if he did, we don't have his text yet. But I suppose for, this is a historical society, right? We encourage you, if you happen to have the diary of a ship that came here so in your family history, please call Bob Ives. How long yep. did ship channel? Oh, uh, we're not open Monday. We're understaffed. Thursday, we're on Sunday, Saturday, Thursday, yes, and we're not open on Monday and Tuesday. There is work going on, and you can walk up to the ship any time that's there. There's a fence around it. can't go down on it. But the display center is Thursday through Sunday because we have a docent there, and if we need a docent, if you have any extra docents and want to come to Bath for half an hour or so, we'd love to have that. Yes, Carol. <laughs> I know what she's going to ask. No, no, actually, I have another question. So you're making the ship to be able to be seaworthy and to take classes. So what does the top of the, of the deck look like? Are you going to are you <coughs> have plans for authentic? elements of that deck or are you going to change the way the deck looks to match the need of perhaps kids sitting on benches? Well, there'll be benches and there'll be life jacket boxes and in fact there was a meeting just yesterday in the freight shed to determine locations of things like that. Um, uh, fire extinguishers have to be around, okay, even though we don't have a fire. There's electrical systems on the boat, there's radio and communication systems and so yes, the answer is the ship will be uh, it will be made to serve the purposes of its voyage, but it will be kept as much as 17th century as possible. We will not go as far as the Bounty. If you all remember the Bounty, there was a movie ship that sunk in a hurricane. The Bounty wanted to have inside photographs, and so down in their hold they didn't have anything. Where did they put the batteries? They put them down in the bottom. What happens when a boat starts taking on water? Your batteries short out, your radio goes, your lights don't work. Uh, you know, that was not a good design. That was a design to accommodate the purpose of the ship was to make a movie. Once the movie was over, somebody bought it and wanted to sail it from one place to other and sing pirate songs and hire people to, for five bucks to walk on the deck. So we don't intend to do that. I think that we'll be much more readily open and say, look, you want a life jacket? It's in that box. You want to sit on that box? You can do that. I mean, I think. I'm not on that committee, but I think it's going to be very much leaning toward open. Yeah, it we'll, has to be Coast Guard approved. It has to be Coast Guard approved. Uh, there are three, there are four, there's four compartments in the ship. One holds the engine. One is going to be kept as a storage area for display, perhaps. People in a static position could perhaps go down and see that. Then there's uh, areas forward where the crew would be. There's a bunk in there. It may even be two bunks. Are there two bunks? Just one bunk? At least two bunks and a galley and all that. There's some people who think we're going to take this on a long voyage. I will wave. <laughs> I have enough trouble with my own boat on a long voyage. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a balance, Carol. And we try and make the, the so far I think we've done well uh, to make it. You know, I don't know that, but I don't 
Yes, they do. Actually, in the, in the picture that I showed, the first one, there was a picture of the Godspeed coming into New York Harbor. Okay. And occasionally, as this lady described, the Constellation sails, Constitution sails, right, down into... Uh... Hey, that's sailing. I, went, I once was out on a ship watching that happen, and it was delightful. I've got video of that. So, but yes, it, it isn't very often that those ships, ships actually do sail, but they're kept maintenance. Uh, the maintenance is kept up so that they will. Good. Well, this has been fun. Yes, miss. That's true. We have records of a ship, of, of, in, in the ship coming in. Oh, here's the Virginia. She just came in and docked. We have records of her being assigned to go and do a fishing expedition. We don't have any records of her coming back. But you know, that wasn't surprising. I mean, I think there's, what's surprising is that it was even written down at all in a historical record. This was a work boat. This was a panel truck. If somebody comes to fix your, your sink that's plugged up, it's that white sided square truck. It carries the tools and brings the people to do what you want. Um, in, in Horace Beck's book, uh, uh, Folklore of Maine, he actually says, and I don't know where he got this information from, I'm on, on the, the hunt for the source of this. He says that the Virginia foundered off the coast of Ireland with a load of tobacco. Wow. In 1620. In 1620. So that where the ship. Found this, I don't know. So the ship lasted 13 years, 12, 12 years. The tobacco, of course, was what made Jamestown successful. That's, that's why Jamestown continued. The investors got something back. They couldn't grow tobacco in England, and so they said, well, this is a pretty good deal. We can sell this stuff. Um, I, I never heard that. We'll look it up. I'll transfer it to our historian. And, uh, but I would have, I will look it up. I, I we will look it up. Source, okay. Uh, we Maybe we can find that. There's still a lot to be found. Isn't that's why we have a historical society, isn't it? That's why we have fun doing this, because it isn't all done and it isn't all told. If it did happen, we can still find some interesting things going on about it. Yes, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Good. Thank you all again for coming, and in two weeks' time here, Wayne Riley will be speaking about shipwrecks of the Oh, that's a scary topic. Sir. Sure.